Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Okay, the webinar is live and live streaming on YouTube. Ooh, yeah, our attendees are starting to enter from the waiting room. Hello, internet. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, we got 30 people in here now. Holy wow. moly. Oh, I see Randall has joined us as well now. Yeah, he's been there for a while. Oh, Alan Dyer's here. That's cool. Oh, That's cool. hi, Alan. <laughs> Haven't heard from him in a while. And Randall, yeah, I've been in touch with him recently. Well, first, he suggested I do this, so that's great. Judy Sterner, cool. Lots of, lots of folks, awesome. Welcome, everybody. We're giving just a few more minutes for, for folks to, to come in from the uh, pre-registration bullpen there in the waiting room. Hey, Petri Varsa is <laughs> here. Hey, Petri, it's been a long time. Steve Dodson. I think he. I think he's been to the Lowell Observatory. <laughs> we have some uh, some chat coming in on the chat box already. I'd just like to remind all of our attendees that if you want more than just the panelists to be able to see your chat, you have to change that little blue uh, menu bar to say all panelists and attendees. Right now, the default is all panelists when you when you chat. So if you want the the other attendees to be able to see it as well, change that to panelists and attendees on that little blue bar. like Petri just did. <laughs> A few numbers are still coming in. Good. Wow. Right. Yeah, we've got 40 people now. That's amazing. Well, that means I'll have to increase my fee, of course. <laughs> <laughs> You're cheap at twice the price, Klaus. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Lowell Observatory is paying you the big bucks, so there you are, right? There we go. Every time I complain about having to do something more, they'll promise to double my salary from nothing. So... <laughs> Forty-five attendees. Wow, that's, that's good. And we've got people from Tucson, people from Lawrence, Kansas. We've got people from Alberta, all over the folks. Uh, wow, Chris just joined us from Vancouver Island. Hello, everyone. We have people from Arizona and Kansas. Yeah, Kelowna, Wisconsin. Niagara Falls. Now, this is one of the advantages of doing things this way instead of live, isn't it? Or in person, rather. Absolutely. You can reach a very broad audience, which is quite nice, actually. It all goes against my grain as a former university professor. I like to see people's faces and eyeballs, but this is just as good in different ways. I'd like to remind all, our, our friends who are watching us on um, YouTube, there are two people watching live there uh, right now that you can use the chat window on YouTube as well. And, and we'll be monitoring that all evening. Okay. Looks like we have a, a fairly stable number now, our 47 here, five panelists, two on YouTube. So with that, I'm just gonna uh, briefly say hello, everyone. Welcome to the most recent um, broadcast uh, live uh, speaker series uh, brought to you in this case uh, by the History Committee of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Um, I'm Phil Groff, I'm the ED of, uh, of the Royal Astronomical Society and very pleased to, to uh, welcome our distinguished panelists here tonight. And because I know I'm the person you've all least come out to see, I'm going to stop talking now and turn things over <laughs> to, our, uh, to our actual MC for the evening, Clark Muir. Clark, take it away.
Thank you, Phil. Um, I am the chair of the history committee and this is our second in a series, hopefully on a monthly basis to uh, uh, do webinars with a history connection in particular to, to our, our own organization. And last month we did Mars, uh, Randall Rosenfeld presented that, the history of Mars observing and Klaus Brash happened to be listening. And uh, we are delighted that he is offered to do our, that he has offered to do our uh, talk tonight. I'll introduce uh, Klaus by reading his bio. Some of you probably read it. Klaus Brash is a retired biomedical scientist and a volunteer at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Born in Germany, his family emigrated to Canada in 1953, where Klaus got hooked on astronomy in his teens, joined the Montreal Centre of the RASC in 1958, and has been an avid amateur ever since. He earned his Bachelor of Science at Concordia and PhD at Carleton University before joining the biology faculty at Queen's University in Kingston. In 1990, he joined California State University, where he served as department chair, dean of science, and director of campus research. Klaus has translated popular French astronomy books into English, lectured widely on topics ranging from life in the universe to astrophotography, and published articles in Astronomy, Sky and, Tel Sky and Telescope Magazine, Sky News, in the Journal of the RASC, and elsewhere. Asteroid 25226, Brash, was recently named for him by the Lowell Observatory. So with that, uh, I will uh, let Klaus take it away. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Clark, and thank you all very much for uh, joining us this evening. It's a real pleasure. I have not been uh, back in Canada for a while to visit my friends and relatives. Uh, of course, right now, that's unlikely to happen anytime soon, thanks to COVID. But uh, let's hope to direct our attention to something a lot more pleasant, and namely, um, talking about the research leg legacy of Lowell Observatory. Uh, I don't know how many of you visited here. It's a, it's a gorgeous location. Flagstaff's a beautiful city and uh, Lowell Observatory is in many ways its crown jewel, if you don't count the uh, Grand Canyon, which is uh, <laughs> within driving distance. Uh, the picture that you see here, the two pictures on the left is a, is a um, Iconic photograph of uh, Percival Lowell, or as he's normally called around here these days, Uncle Percy, uh, at the control of his then newly finished 24-inch uh, Clark refractor. Um, the chair and the ladder setup that you see is what he used to elevate himself to be able to look through the telescope, uh, depending on what angle it was pointed at. During one of my early visits here, you see a picture of a clear imposter trying to mimic uh, what uh, looked like uh, um, uh, Percy. And I'm sitting on the same chair and the same ladder. This is a historic uh, facility. It's a Lowell Observatory, the Clark Telescope, and many other of its buildings are actually on the US National Historic Register. And I have that photograph to thank my old friend, Terence Dickinson, who I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Now, um, before I delve into the historical aspects of the observatory, I want to just step back briefly to give a historic back look or overview. And namely that the century 1750 to 1850, which kind of just preceded all of the booming astronomical activity of the late uh, 1800s, several advan technical advances were made, uh, which really helped to shift astronomy from the purely visual realm to something much more uh, um, technically and scientifically valid. For instance, the achromatic lenses, uh, what the acro lens was invented and modified and improved, as well as silver coated glass mirrors for reflecting telescopes. Prior to that, of course, it was, uh, you know, metal coated, which tarnished very often. Uh, and so it's amazing what the astronomers prior to achromatic lenses and uh, prior to, uh, to metal mirrors were able to accomplish, uh, uh, given the, the optical and other problems involved. What was equally important, though, was the, the invention of diffraction gratings 
and the science of spectroscopy. Um, also, equatorial mounts and clock drive mechanisms were developed, and of course, photography. This beautiful telescope that you see pictured here on the right was actually built by the famed German engineer and physicist uh, Josef von, von Fraunhofer. Uh, he uh, developed and built this telescope as the largest reflect, refracting telescope at the time. Its diameter was almost uh, 250 millimeters. You notice that he has a very sturdy equatorial mount with counterweight. This was, is what we now consider the so-called German equatorial. He developed and invented that and modified it beautifully. And he also installed a clock drive mechanism using pulleys and uh, uh, similar uh, types of uh, mechanisms in order to be able to track the mount at sidereal rates, which was again a huge, huge advance for the time. The uh, other major in invention and development, of course, was photography. And this was uh, first done by uh, the famed French uh, scientist Louis Daguerre in 1844. Uh, he, uh, that's a picture of him in 1844, but he developed the photographic uh, basis of daguerreotype, which was a wet plate uh, as opposed to dry plates of film or glass. And it was a laborious and dangerous kind of method to use because in order to get uh, this type of image on a wet plate, uh, it, uh, you had to be a bit of a masochist because it took forever. And also there were all kinds of noxious fumes that you would have inhaled as part of the chemical reaction. So on the right, you see the, the first reliably dated photo, 1837, that uh, uh, Louis Daguerre took. And this was probably a 10 to 15 minute exposure because those the photographic plates were so slow and so inefficient at recording light. And hence many of the early photographs had to be still light in basically uh, full sunlight in order to even register. However, very quickly thereafter, astronomers took up this, uh, this technique, realizing of course that photography would be far more efficient, accurate, and reliable than just plain visual work. And J.W. Draper took this one of the full moon, and you can see already in 1840, this is a beautiful picture. And it was, didn't take much for people to realize that this was the future of astronomy in many, many ways. Now, the ultimate perfection of this kind of uh, work was actually happened sort of at the turn of the last century, around 1900. And what you see here is these two gentlemen, Louis and Pourceux, who were um, at Paris Observatory. And uh, they did made the very first reliable photographic atlas of the entire visible portion of the moon. And you can see that this is high quality given the limitations they worked under with very grainy and slow plates. But at this time, it was no longer daguerreotype. It was actually emulsion, stable photographic emulsion. What I get a real kick out of, if you ever get a chance to look at this in a book, this is the telescope that they used at Paris Observatory. Uh, and this uh, is actually a um, Coudé photograph. I could a rather uh, image structure. You have a, um, a, a siderostat here following catching the, the moon and then a refractor lens and then the image would be sent up here to this little cabin where the operator could then insert plates and uh, focus, etc. And in fact, in order to make this photo this atlas, photographic atlas, they took several hundred images and then selected the very best. It was deemed so good at the time that, in fact, it was the standard of reference for lunar, uh, for, uh, for lunar atlases way up until about the eight, 1940s, believe it or not. Uh, this is how fine this was considered workmanship at the time. Now, the year 1888 has special significance for many reasons, but in particular for Lowell Observatory and what was to follow. 
The 1888 uh, uh, opposition of Mars was one of the closest ones uh, at the time when new and, and effectively very good telescopes were had become available. And Giovanni Schiaparelli uh, at Milan Observatory had a, I believe it was a nine inch diameter, if I could be wrong, uh, refractor. And he was a renowned, uh, uh, really, he discovered comets, the, the visual star work, he's highly respected. And he decided to essentially doing this very close uh, uh, opposition of Mars to finally map all of the surface features and assign official names to them. And so on the right, what you see here is one of his maps uh, from that time. Unfortunately, he saw a lot of streaky linear features, which uh, he, not unfortunately, he, <laughs> that he called canali, which in Italian really means channels. He did not intend them to be ever seen as actual canals. Uh, but using that word when it was translated into English and other languages, of course, it set off a very different uh, course of, of development. And in fact, his discoveries and, uh, uh, and the basically uh, published scientific papers, Schiaparelli that is, uh, spurned uh, Percival Lowell, uh, a wealthy Bostonian, who was really looking for something to excel at because he traveled widely to Asia and written books about that. And uh, he was always, he was a trained mathematician and he was always interested in astronomy as a child. He was given a small telescope, but now given the idea that Mars might be inhabited, he is now uh, decided to devote the rest of his life uh, to uh, astronomy. And he commissioned, that goes to show you how wealthy the family was, a textile, many generations of textiles in the Boston area. Uh, he commissioned a firm of Alvin Clark and Sons, which was by then the most renowned uh, one in the United States, to build him his own personal 24 inch or 60 inch aperture refractor. At the time that cost an estimated $20,000, it would be more like uh, probably several million dollars today equivalent. Uh, what he also realized to his credit was that most of the great observatories in uh, all over Europe and in North America were in fact located uh, in big cities on the East Coast. And uh, observatories had been used at the time primarily for timekeeping and uh, uh, things of that nature so that uh, navigation could be uh, done accurately by reading the stars and the latitude and longitude kind of thing. But he realized that a place like where the uh, Naval Observatory was in Washington, D.C., uh, by the name of Foggy Bottom, it was probably not the best place in the world for an observatory. And he realized that if he wanted to really excel at that, he had to move to clearer skies and higher elevation to be above most of the moisture that interferes with astro astronomical observing uh, to this day. So he uh, sent a crew out to check out the west part of the, the west coast, mostly in Arizona. For some reason, he liked the idea there. And ultimately, uh, he ended up in Flagstaff, much to the light of the uh, uh, locals at the time, because Flagstaff was essentially a small lumber city. And it had the good luck that the, uh, that the railway actually passed through Flagstaff on its way to Los Angeles. And of course, all the way from the East Coast. So this pro provided transportation for Lowell and any of his people interested in coming out this way. So this was quite, quite the beginning. And it was opened in 1894. And here you see a picture of it uh, from 1895. All of these images, by the way, are from the Lowell Observatory archives. And what you'll notice here within the observatory is that it was all built out of wood, uh, these wooden planks here. It, initially, they put a tarp dome on it. That didn't last very long in the Flagstaff winds. So then it was replaced uh, uh, with wood. The first telescope that was actually installed here was an 18 inch, not a Clark, another one that was uh, was on loan to the observatory. But then when the Clark showed up, that was it. And you'll notice here again, the German Equatorial Mount is very high up here. 
and there was a weight-driven clock drive inside the column, so it was possible to accurately track with this telescope. And I can vouch for the fact that it's optically superb, having looked through it many times. Now, I want to sidestep just a little bit. One of the reasons that canals became such a rage at the time, especially thanks to Lowell and, and others, is that uh, canal mania, as the British, in fact, called it, uh, was all, all the rage in the mid, uh, uh, sort of before the Industrial Revolution and Railway. Uh, England, for example, built canals crisscrossing the country largely for purposes of travel and transport of goods, not for irrigation, certainly not in England, where there's more than ample water. Uh, and in fact, at one point, England had something like 4,000 kilometers of canals, if you can imagine that. They were, most of them were replaced later on by railway. But England wasn't the only place. Uh, uh, North America, as you can see from this map here, wherever you see these lines, they were all canals. They were all built uh, for transportation. Many of them had docks, uh, you know, uh, so that you could rise to higher elevation and so on. And this was shipping, travel, and transport of, of materials. So canals were really the rage. And at the time, too, the two main ones, the Suez Canal and then later the Panama Canal, were built at great cost and for lots of labor. But they basically changed many of the geopolitical aspects of the world at the time because it now meant ship travel and other things was much faster and, and uh, easier to facilitate. Arizona, as Lowell was here, in fact, as he moved over here, was considered a desert wasteland because at the time, anything that wasn't usable by people for agriculture or industry or something would be considered a wasteland. So they too, before as Arizona became a state, uh, had all kinds of discussions and arguments as to what would be the best way of building canals to essentially turn this wasteland into um, useful agricultural lands. And there's a whole literature on that, in fact, in the state uh, uh, discussing the pros and cons. Well, Lowell, as you all know, and you've probably all seen maps of this, was convinced that the canals that he thought he saw uh, were in fact the work of a dying but advanced uh, civilization on Mars and that they were building these irrigation canals in order to be able to bring water from the polar caps to the equatorial, warmer equatorial regions and for obviously for agricultural purposes. And it was interesting too because Lowell was convinced, as were many people at the time, that planets went through certain types of evolution. Uh, for example, he posited that Venus was a primitive planet and had not quite reached a level where it would be habitable by intelligent beings. The Earth was at the peak of that, and Mars was dying, and so it was past its prime. And this is kind of the, the mentality that prevailed very much at the time. Part of the reason was that uh, many of the, the scientists, even at the time, still lived in, by the philosophy of the plurality of the worlds, which translated essentially into a philosophy stating that uh, God during his creation would never have built or created anything that was useless or without purpose. And so many people thought that most planets, prior to that anyways, were inhabited, including luminaries like William Herschel, uh, Newton, and many, many others at the time were convinced that all worlds were inhabited, an interesting philosophy, which of course gradually faded away. So here you see a, a, a reproduction of an original uh, drawing by Lowell. Here's one of his many global maps for each uh, opposition of Mars, he would see more and more uh, <laughs> of these canals. And since this, uh, photography had now reached the technological stage where it would be possible in theory, at least to photograph them, here you see a 1907 uh, a photograph of Mars with these faint fuzzies, uh, which uh, turned out to be some of these more prominent features. And I'll be returning to that in, in a little bit. Now, Lowell was also an incredible self-promoter and he was a very talented, uh, 
um, speaker. Uh, and so when, when the discovery was announced in the popular press and elsewhere that Martians are building uh, canals and that there's a likely to be a dying civilization, everybody who was into uh, sort of this kind of idea bought it because he was highly respected, even though many of the prominent professional astronomers at the time were quite dubious. Uh, and uh, what was even more interesting was that the debate would be how could a 24 inch telescope possibly resolve these thin lines that far away. And of course, uh, there was huge debate as to whether the seeing conditions in Flagstaff were so much superior and whether the optics of Clark, this Clark was so much superior. And basically, the uh, Lowell got into a huge uh, fight with E.E. Uh, e. Barnard and others at Lick Observatory in, uh, on, uh, in California, who had the then largest refracting telescope in the world, a 36 inch, and they never saw these canals. So it became quite a competition, as you can imagine. Now, at the time as well, coincidentally, and maybe not so coincidentally, H.G. Wells, the famed uh, science fiction writer in Britain, uh, wrote War of the Worlds. And uh, in that, of course, he uh, uh, argued that the advanced technology of Martians, they came over to invade the Earth because they were after our resources, among other things. And they had superior weapons, which made it possible for them to, in fact, do this. And that was that fantasy, of course. However, what many uh, astronomers, even those who didn't believe they were artificial, uh, still thought that there might be channels on Mars where water would indeed come from the polar caps and kind of uh, ooze into the desert. And that's why there, some of them were wider than just linear features. And that's perhaps why some of them were visible. None of this stopped uh, um, Lowell from going, giving speeches and writing books, Mars and its canals, Mars is the abode of life, among others, uh, in order to strengthen his notion that there was an advanced civilization on Mars. Uh, I remember when I was a kid growing up in Toronto when this fantastic movie version, the first Hollywood movie version of War of the Worlds was shown with these incredibly high-tech machines and these heat ray guns. And I remember being scared witless, uh, watching the movie, but also fascinated at the notion that maybe there are is life on, on other worlds. Uh, in 1938, uh, Wells, not, uh, not HG, but uh, the actor, did a live radio show uh, uh, from uh, New Jersey without telling people that it was that or not making it very clear. And he pretended to be a radio reporter reporting on this invasion that it was taking place on the East Coast. And it caused panic, absolute panic in many places on the East Coast. And then several new versions of the War of the Worlds movies have been made. And in part this then I think is what led to later on to the whole notion that there might be alien powers out there that are you know, flying saucers or invading us or whatever have you. And of course still exists to this day. All of this came to an abrupt end, at least for many uh, people when uh, the Mariner flyby in 1964, I, I well remember watching with bated breath as these grainy images were sent back to Earth. And all of a sudden, everybody was shocked that uh, uh, Mars was, my goodness, it looked more like the moon, desert and craters, and not certainly no canals, and probably no life either. And it was quite a disappointment in many ways for professionals and, and uh, other people interested in Mars. And of course, we know that was premature since Mars is, as we've since discovered, is a lot more interesting, despite not having canals on it. And here is uh, something I just wanted to emphasize. Not all of the features that Lowell and his contemporaries actually observed from Earth were in fact, uh, uh, you know, illusions or optical defects. In fact, we can now see for example, this is the latest, one of the late uh, NASA maps of the albedo features uh, super to, uh, superimposed against the craters and other structures that have since been discovered on Mars. 
Here's Sturgis Major, here's Hellas, for those of you who are still looking at Martian features. But here's a structure called, what, what, which was called Kerberos. We now know that this is a volcanic uh, high area on, on Mars. And you'll notice too that some of these structures are strictly linear and they're kind of visible here. And most prominently of all, many, many people, in fact, the, the area was called Coprates, the Canal Coprates. We now know that's Valles Marineris. So uh, we now know, of course, that any apparent linear features like these, uh, albedo features, are in fact not canals or anything of the sort, but what they are is windblown dust and volcanic material that's accumulated and slowly dispersed or, or driven around on the surface of Mars, thanks to the massive dust storms that often uh, ensue there. Uh, and uh, here's, I, I just want to show a couple of, of interesting images. Here's one of the images that was taken in uh, photographs taken by the International Planetary Patrol, 1971. And I'll talk about that in a minute because that was a major research program at Lowell Observatory showing evidence of the first dust storm. But here again is Valles Marineris. Nobody knew that, of course, at the time. And here it is right there. And you notice it's also dark. It, uh, it's one of the albedo features. So it was clearly visible. And here's a picture that was taken by uh, one of my uh, friends, a Belgian uh, imager, Leo Ars. And these are some of the beautiful new digital images that are now possible with modest equipment from Earth by amateurs. He used the C14 and has taken some remarkable photographs. So there's lots of interest in Mars, not just from the historic standpoint, of course, but also from what's visible today by uh, equipment and uh, technological advances. Lots of fun. Now, in addition to all the Mars canal hoopla, uh, Lowell did in fact hire some very, very fine and competent uh, uh, colleagues um, that became outstanding astronomers in their own right. Carl Lampland was a German uh, engineer, I believe, who was brought over to uh, uh, work for at Lowell Observatory by uh, Percival. And what he was really good at was making gadgets. For example, he made uh, all kinds of uh, photometric or pre-photometric materials, thermocouples to measure the temperature of stars and other things through telescopes. And he built this remarkable camera, uh, which was used extensively for many, many years. And what he was able to do there, this is now a, a glass film play. And uh, what, you're, what you have here is about standard inches. And what this allowed people to do is to take several sequential by just turning a screw or any planet that he was photographing. And that was a huge advancement. He also introduced the use of color filters for the first time to uh, highlight different types of detail on the planets. Now you notice here are 1904 images of Jupiter and Saturn taken through yellow light. Notice how terribly grainy these images are, but they were showing stuff that had not been, been visible before. And so he was really quite a pioneer in that regard. Lampland also pioneered deep sky photography, uh, the biggest telescope at the time that Lowell commissioned was a 42 inch reflector, uh, which uh, you see now is this is the, everything had to be made, the optics weren't made here, but everything else, the mechanical support and so on was all built out of uh, uh, steel and iron that was actually made here in Flagstaff because Flagstaff was a major railway town. So there were a lot of people who were good at iron work and other things, and they would be hired to build stuff like this. Uh, and here's a picture that he took of the, um, uh, Messier 20, uh, the Triffid Nebula, uh, and here's one, of course, of everyone's favorite spiral galaxy. So these were quite excellent uh, photographs for the time. Now, here's a picture of the fully restored, uh, now historic 13-inch astrographic telescope, or also known as the Pluto Discovery Telescope. This was one of the first telescopes, again, commissioned by Lowell. 
uh, that was entirely based, uh, built for photography to provide a very large 14 by 14 inch flat field to photograph stars and other things. And uh, what you uh, and it was a triplet lens system. So it was really quite advanced and unusual for its day. Now, the reason Lowell commissioned this was, of course, this search for planet X. Lowell was convinced uh, from his calculations as a mathematician that because there were some perturbations in the orbit of Neptune, that there must be another planet further out that was tugging at Neptune, causing these perturbations. The logic behind this was that Neptune itself had been discovered uh, 50 years or so prior to Lowell's arrival. And that was because there were major perturbations in the orbital dynamics of Uranus. And so uh, the mathematicians at the time uh, calculated where and what a large planet further out than Uranus should be. And of course, that's how Neptune was discovered. Uh, and uh, now Lowell con was convinced there was another big planet out there. And he mounted actually three photographic searches uh, with smaller telescopes and lenses and small plates. And none of them found anything, at least not at the time. It turns out he actually had photographed, they had photographed Pluto, just didn't realize they had caught it. However, when after uh, Lowell passed away and uh, one of his great hirees, uh, Vesto Slifer, I uh, will mention him in a moment, who was director, and he decided to continue the search now using the big astrographic uh, telescope that you just saw. And they hired Clyde Tombo, who was a very young man, rather naive at the time, from Kansas, who nonetheless lived on a farm and was fascinated by astronomy and built his own telescope and made some beautiful observations of the planets and submitted these to uh, Vesto Slifer and asked if these were any good. He wanted, so he had no way of knowing. And the only observatory he knew about was Lowell because of the canal story. So he was hired by Vesto to come out and work at Lowell and did not just take pictures looking for planet X, uh, but also mending fences, taking care of the livestock that was here and other kinds of menial tasks. He turned out to be a very, very gifted young man. And then here, what you see is the discovery plate of Pluto. And you can see it jumping here because what he would do is he would take photographs across the uh, ecliptic uh, and he would take uh, each one of these took 40 minutes. Uh, and then he would take one and then go back the next week and take another. And then at the time in the, uh, in the late 1920s, as the Zeiss company in Germany had, uh, had developed a blink comparator where you would put two adjacent plates next to each other through a, basically a, 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 a optical pathway. And by looking at one alternately over the other, you would see movement if anything in the field of view had moved. And since the fixed stars would move over that period of time, uh, but a planet or a comet or an asteroid would, that's how Pluto was discovered. Now, much to the disappointment of uh, Lowell astronomers at the time, Pluto turned out to be very tiny and no visible disk, nothing like Lowell had hoped for another Uranus or Neptune. Uh, and it was not really until the New Horizons flyby a couple of years ago that we began to realize that uh, Pluto is one of the most interesting bodies in our solar system. Uh, and uh, that deserves a whole talk by itself uh, because nobody expected it to be so detailed, to have so much geology. And in fact, the brown stuff that you see here covering it is in fact uh, organic residue of all sorts of things. So it's a fascinating planet. Anyway, that's another talk. Close. But, yes. Close. We have a quick question here from uh, Peter Jedicke. Um, yeah. And he asks... Uh, who first used the blink technique? Was it Clyde or was it somebody else? As far as I know, in terms of this type of approach, that was, uh, was Clyde. 
but the the uh, method was was also used uh, for medical purposes because people would take a petri place a petri dishes with different uh, um, cellular and bacterial colonies on them and then look for any new ones that had appeared over time again taking pictures of one and then the other so it was a is a method that was used not just for astronomy uh, but other purposes as well great thank you so much Thanks well, to Peter for the question. Yeah, the good thing that uh, this also brought about the discovery of Pluto is that it suddenly rocketed the observatory back into uh, from infamy about the canals to respectability for having made this great discovery. And of course, this went all over the world in newspapers, etc., as one would expect. And of course, as we now know, uh, Pluto is not part of the original family of planets around the sun, but very likely a copied, a, a ca captured rather Kuiper belt object. And that's why it was demoted as a planet to a minor planet. But for those of us who grew up with nine planets, Pluto is still our favorite planet. All right, now the other astronomer that, uh, that was hired uh, turned out to be a phenomenal one as well by Lowell originally were two actually, Earl and Vesto Slipher, they were brothers. Earl Slipher was the premier uh, photographer of planets basically up until the uh, mid 1960s. And among other things, he developed what we now call image stacking. What he did, he called it integration printing. And you'll notice here in this classic photograph of Saturn that he took, this is a single image and notice how grainy it is and low contrast. What he did, he took that same image and printed, but he did, he, he'd have a special projector in the dark room with emulsion here for paper. And then he would flash image, uh, brief exposures of this same image up to 10 times onto this uh, uh, paper. And when he did that, what he managed to do is in, you know, clear in this image down here, you notice much of the graininess has been reduced. So the signal to noise ratio has been greatly improved and contrast has improved tremendously. So he immediately started applying that to a photography of any sort uh, that he could. And uh, he made some of the very classic and at the time just superb photographs of some of the major planets. Here you see Venus at inferior conjunction, photographed very, very close to the sun. And what this shows, of course, is that its atmosphere refracts light fully around the globe, even though we can't see the globe itself due to the thick gas. Here's one of the best photographs in, uh, in 1941 of Mars showing incredible amount of detail and better, a whole nuanced series of, of uh, intensities, which was really not possible before. And here's a beautiful picture of Jupiter and Io in transit, uh, also taken in 1938. And then here is one of his best ever of Saturn, taken as late as 1946, by which time film uh, or plates had, uh, um, the emulsions had been much improved over time and were far less gray, grainy. And uh, so he was really a master. He published two beautiful books of his images and photographs. And if you ever get a chance to, uh, to look them up, uh, please do. Now, interestingly enough, another astronomer, he was at Lowell only for a short time in the 1950s, Harold Johnson, tried the same approach for deep sky photography using the 13 inch uh, Pluto astrograph. So what you're seeing here is a single 45 minute exposure of Messe 33. And then he took 10 of those, 10 separate exposures and did the same integration printing. And you notice how improved it is. The stars are finer, much sharper. There's more detail of the nebulosity visible. And in fact, it gained a full 1.5 magnitudes in, in uh, uh, depth, uh, which is quite remarkable. Unfortunately, he published this in, in the rather obscure uh, um, archives of Lowell Observatory and never made much, much more use of it. 
Uh, and then here's a photograph I took not too long ago with uh, my C11 digitally. And you'll notice that the, uh, the difference in terms of recording sharpness and in fact, in re resolution of stars is so much better thanks to digital imaging. But again, here was some pioneering work done at Lowell uh, to, uh, to uh, foretell essentially what was going to be the future of imaging. My favorite one of the Lowell Observatory uh, original astronomers was, was the, uh, the brother Vesto Slifer. And he is another person who is va vastly under-recognized for his achievements, in part because after the uh, Lowell's death, uh, the observatory fell into rather disrepute because of the canal thing. Also, they didn't have very much money. And so the three astronomers, Lamplin and the two Vesto, uh, the two Slifer brothers, essentially had to take secondhand jobs elsewhere in order to make a living and keep the observatory going. And they were also rather shy and reluctant to publish their observations for fear that they would not be believed, which is truly sad. Anyhow, once again, though, Percival Lowell. Uh, did the right things sometimes for the wrong reasons. Uh, he was, at, as you might recall, at the beginning of before, before Hubble and all, all those uh, people clarified what galaxies and so on were, it was generally believed that spiral nebulae, anything that was fuzzy or, or gaseous was called a nebula, and spiral nebulae, uh, Lowell was convinced were protoplanetary disks actually, that they were basically young solar systems in the making. And everybody thought they were in within the Milky Way, our own galaxy. And so he commissioned Brachier and company to make this magnificent, if you ever get a chance to look at it, the workmanship is just stunning, spectrograph. And here it is uh, Slifer using it on the Clark telescope. And the idea was to take as many spectra of these nebulae in order to find out if these were indeed primitive or immature solar system, to find out what the chemical composition would be through spectroscopy. And that's essentially what uh, Slifer uh, Vesto did. Now, remember he was using very slow emulsions. This was all pre-1920, very slow emulsions on a telescope that had a very long F-ratio and small aperture. So in many cases, to record a spectrum of a faint nebula, uh, he had to spend several nights in succession to get a, catch enough photons to actually register an image. And in fact, the record, I believe, is 60 hours worth of exposure in order to achieve this. So it was incredibly um, determined. And what he discovered, here are the radial velocities of the 25 spiral nebulae that he took spectra of. Now, he soon realized that uh, in order to get these kinds of radial velocities, which you could only measure through spectroscopy, uh, these things could not be in our own uh, Milky Way. They had to rely beyond that. And so what's interesting is he very quickly noticed that many of them had negative radial velocity. And in other words, they were coming towards us like the Doppler effect. And, uh, and, and these were only of the 25 that you looked at, only these four, namely the Andromeda galaxy, M32, the pinwheel M33 and M81 in Ursa Major. All the others had positive radial velocities, some in fact exceeding a thousand kilometers per second. And a simple calculation even at the time suggested that there's no way that this, these objects could have emanated from the Milky Way and shot away at that pace and, and to that whatever distance it was. He didn't know absolute distances. He could just measure the rate of, of movement. And he presented that work in, in, in 1914 to the um, American Astronomical Union meeting. And in the audience was a young Edwin Hubble who immediately caught on that this was really interesting stuff. 
and basically realized that he had bigger and better telescopes, namely the 60 inch and later the 100 inch Mount Wilson. And then of course he discovered that the, uh, the, the fainter the galaxy, the further away it was from us, the faster it was receding from us. So he then came to the conclusion that the universe is expanding, which was a very valid conclusion. Unfortunately, he never gave Slifer any credit for that beyond a brief mention in one of his early papers. So he, Slifer really needs to be one of the fathers of the expanding universe uh, and people are increasingly uh, getting to, uh, to appreciate that. Now, of course, here's a Hubble photograph of a deep sky and we're still facing with the conundrum of how fast is the universe and is it really expanding or is it hiccuping, going slow and then fast, et cetera? Those are questions for the future. But again, all of this began uh, well over a hundred years ago, thanks to Vestas Leifer's discovery. Now the space age, which essentially began in 1957 with the launch of Sputnik uh, 1. And the Lowell Observatory was very active at that time. It had now a bunch of very new, uh, outstanding astronomers, so including uh, among them, uh, William Baum, uh, who um, decided that one of the things that needed to be done in modern times from 1960 to about 75, was to establish a patrol sequence whereby the bright planets were monitored essentially 24 seven by setting up a network across the world of telescopes uh, equipped with the same type of camera, the same sets of filters, et cetera, and could take intensive photographs and, and a constant record. So what you're seeing here, for example, is a series of photographs from that, uh, from that program of Venus in ultraviolet light. Now here's a, a this, these cameras were automatic. Uh, they weren't uh, digitized, they were film-based, but they were electronically automatic. And every telescope that was part of this patrol program had the same cameras. So you're seeing here images of Mars in red, green, blue, and ultraviolet light. And what this helped to do was to show different levels of the atmosphere of Mars. Uh, here you see the top surface only with clouds and dust storms. And here you see in deep red, you see the darkest of the uh, albedo features. Now ultraviolet light for Venus was very useful because it penetrated below the cloud deck to some extent. And that then allowed the astronomers to realize that the cloud deck of Venus was retrograde in terms of rotation compared to, the Venus, to Venus itself. And you'll notice here, here's a sequence of photographs of Mars over a 24 hour period, taken from Chile, from New Mexico, Lowell, Hawaii, Australia, South Africa, Chile, et cetera, again. This is the network that was set up. And here you see it, there were a couple of uh, observatories in, in the US, in Hawaii, South Africa, Chile, India, and a couple in Europe as well, off and on, and then two in Australia as part of this program. This program was actually funded by NASA. And in fact, uh, one of the buildings, the uh, Planetary Research Building at Lowell Observatory uh, was established because of that. Here's a typical telescope that was actually built. There were the three, there were three, uh, uh, the um, a, a refractor in India. Uh, they were all in the 24 to 26 inch aperture. And then there were a series of these uh, uh, Cassegrain telescopes uh, built uh, that were then sent around the world so that everything would be the same, the same focal length, same image scale, same cameras. And here you see uh, Dale Crickshank, still one of the world's leading planetary astronomers and a good friend of mine, when he was a student working in Hawaii uh, with a 24 inch uh, Mauna Kea telescope. And one of the great discoveries that uh, this program brought about uh, was essentially here a series, of, a series of photographs in 1973 of a developing dust storm on Mars. 
And you can see here at the very beginnings, and then by the time, uh, several days later, by the eighth day, the planet was completely enveloped in the shroud of dust. Uh, and the interesting thing here was the previous data on Mars and dust storms actually let people predict that there would be one roughly at this time during this opposition. So that was a major step forward in our understanding of Martian um, meteorology. Uh, here are some photographs of Jupiter in ultraviolet light penetrating uh, fairly deep into the atmosphere and actually finding evidence where the, a new disturbance was about to pop out. Now notice how grainy these photographs are, really. Again, even in 71 and so on, film was pretty grainy. If you wanted to keep it fast and take short exposures, which was necessary at the time. In contrast here, I'm showing you some more images by my friend Leo Erst of Jupiter that he took from his backyard in near Brussels in Belgium with a C-14. Look at the level of resolution possible today uh, with such a small instrument thanks to technology and software and the like. Now, the last major scientific project that the Clark Telescope was involved in was part of the photographic atlas of the moon, which was necessary. The program was begun in 1960 in preparation for the Apollo moon program. Directing this was the famed astronomer Gerald Kuiper, uh, who was uh, at, Wisconsin at that time at the University of Arizona in the Lunar Planetary Lab. And what he and his colleagues did was to collect the best photographs available at the time from across the world, whatever observatory had really good photographs, including Yerkes like Pictomidae and others, uh, and uh, compile a photographic atlas then that would be as precise as possible again for the time. Uh, this is where uh, Gene Shoemaker of uh, Shoemaker Levy fame, as you probably know, a, a trained geologist with great interest in astronomy. And what he had done was, believe it or not, up to that time, there was still a huge debate as to whether lunar craters were in fact caused by impact due to asteroids and meteorites or whether they were volcanic in origin. There was still a large debate about that. Shoemaker succeeded in, he did his PhD on the uh, 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 lunar, uh, on rather meteor crater here nearby in Flagstaff. And he showed for the first time definitively that this was an impact basin because there was nothing buried deep down in the ground. Everything had happened because a large asteroid had come in and exploded essentially above the surface and scattered material all over the place. Because of that, he was then given money by NASA to establish, again here in Flagstaff, the astrogeology program that would then be the headquarters for the development of the best lunar maps possible using photographs and then the best guesses as to what this terrain might be. For example, this yellow uh, thing here around Copernicus was essentially the splash field of where material had shot out and been liquefied by the intensity of the impact that caused the crater. Now, even the best photographs at the time, because of the graininess of the film, etc., uh, were not good enough as required for the Apollo moon program. So here you see a, a reproduction of a photograph of uh, taken in 1960 of one of the best images of Copernicus. And here you see Ian Whittaker, who was one of the great uh, uh, map maker, makers of his time. And Lowell Observatory, as well as Lick and Yerkes, were then used by visual observers to add detail that could not be photographed with the with very, very grainy emulsions available at the time because they could, they could see far more than, than could be recorded. And so they would then jot down the additional information and then airbrush them into images. So here you see uh, 1964, an airbrushed image of the same crater. And you notice how much more detail and refined structure there was added. And then we come to the 21st century. 
And here you see yours truly, uh, occasionally having access to this wonderful telescope. And uh, the gentleman behind me here, some of you may know him, he's Kevin Schindler, uh, who is the uh, Lawless Observatory historian and a very good friend of mine. And uh, our goal for a while was to try and take uh, digital images now of the moon of various places that the astronauts had landed on, on the landing sites, and then compare them to the original maps that were used by them. And we didn't get too far, but we got fairly far. My first opportunity to use the Great Refractor was actually earlier than that, in 2005, when I had this magnificent, super powerful 3.3 megapixels uh, <laughs> Nikon Coolpix, uh, and I took series, a series of photographs under good seeing of um, Saturn. And what I would do is take three or four of them in a row and then stack them. And you'll notice right away that uh, one of the problems using an achromatic refractor for color imaging is that there's too much chromatic aberration. Uh, and so it's very hard to balance out the colors from the uh, additional of the chromatic distortions caused by the lens. Even a processed image isn't much better. So instead, what I started doing, I converted them all to monochrome, which then made it for far better, actually, uh, resolution and contrast. But still, with the, with the then available, among the best sort of popularly available um, digital cameras, not any better than what uh, um, Vestos, uh, Earl Slifer did in 1946 with the then best available uh, films, but it was fun to try. After that, I was able to now use a digital camera, the Canon uh, 50D, and again, do the same thing, take a whole series of photographs in succession, stack them, and then process them. And as you can see, the optical quality of this telescope is absolutely stunning. Looking through it, you wouldn't believe the kind of detail that you can see. Almost makes me believe that maybe uh, canals were visible, except I've seen Mars through it many times and there are no canals, but gorgeous imaging under good seeing. Uh, here's the Marinicteris region to give you a scale here. These, these are the three uh, the craters that have been studied by many, many lunar uh, enthusiasts, Theophilus, Cyrillus, and Katharina. And we know from the degree of erosion of the craters uh, that uh, this uh, Theophilus was the youngest impact basin because you can see that it still has very strong uh, walls, whereas these other walls have been gradually eroded over time by being filled in with dust and the like. And then here's a picture I was particularly pleased with. This is of the great crater Alphonsus, uh, Ptolemaeus rather. In the series here are Arzakel, Alphonsus, and uh, Ptolemaeus. And uh, just a, on a night of good seeing, again, using just a digital camera and taking about a dozen or two uh, photographs in sequence and stacking them, Notice the incredible detail that you resolve. Many of these crater pits are less than a kilometer in diameter. So that's phenomenal resolution. And contrasting my image with uh, the best one available uh, during 1963 of the lunar uh, mapping efforts then. And you can see that there's much more detail that I've recorded here, thanks to image stacking and processing than was possible even at the time visually. So we've come a long way. And here's my favorite. This is the best image available at the time in 64 of Copernicus. And here's a webcam image I took uh, not too long ago of that crater. Uh, and again, you see the incredible detail visible with that. This was not on a night of particularly good seeing either. Now you may be wondering why I'm showing you this little craterlet here, this doublet named Philip Fout. Philip Fout was a distant cousin of my mother's. Uh, her name, maiden name is Fout. And he was also the last of the great uh, German uh, visual lunar mappers in the early part of the uh, uh, 19th of the 20th century. He was a superb um, sketcher and observer. 
Unfortunately, he was also a bit of a crackpot, so he's tended to be uh, ignored by his contemporaries. But the uh, IAU nonetheless named the crater after him for his grand efforts to map the moon. So what about the next 100 years? Um, this is the fully refurbished Clark telescope now, shortly after it was, it took about three years to get it back to full operation, clean up everything, et cetera. It looks beautiful now. Thanks to this gentleman right here. Uh, this is Ralph Nye, the telescope guy who has since retired and he was one of the chief people at Lowell taking care of observatories. And this is me, he's giving me a little tour of all the new goodies they had added to it. Beyond the Clark Telescope, however, um, Lowell Observatory now has moved on to bigger and better as things, as some of you may know. Uh, they are now the proud co-owners of the Lowell Discovery Telescope, which is a magnificent 4.3 meter uh, active optics telescope. Here we'll be given a tour by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Hall, the director of Lowell Observatory. This telescope is, uh, the mirror is only about four inches thick, but it's supported by a number of uh, uh, computer controlled uh, activators at the base so that it'll always keep a perfect um, shape no matter which part of the sky it's being pointed. Uh, since this early time, it now is mounted with several uh, major instruments, photometers, spectrographs, etc. And what the advantage that it has, it can be put in two configurations, a wide field or any one of the longer focal lengths. And uh, the, the uh, uh, instrument bay, which you see back here, right here, the instrument bay, those you can very quickly change from one instrument to the other by push of a button and just rotate the next spectrograph or the camera or whatever it is that you're interested in using. The dome itself, you see a close up of it here, is designed so that it doesn't have to be, uh, um, it can stay at ambient temperature by opening these louvers and other things so that essentially uh, during the heat of the day, AC is on, but at night it very quickly acclimates to the ambient temperature. It sits on a, a, a mesa that was used for mining purposes for many years, about 40 miles south of Flagstaff, a place called Happy Jack. And it was selected after extensive studies of to where the best seeing conditions would be in the neighborhood of Lowell Observatory. And this turns out to be a superb spot. Several other universities and other agencies are partnering with Lowell now for the use of this telescope. It's a wonderful instrument. I've had the pleasure of looking through it actually uh, with the eyepiece and uh, our astronomy club was invited to uh, actually come out before it was fully commissioned. And one night of outstanding seeing, we saw things that uh, were unbelievable and, and we went back home all depressed because our little telescopes looked like toys in comparison. The best view of Jupiter I've ever had. And in fact, just as we were looking at it at about 600 magnification, was that Io, its closest moon, was just entering transit. And Io looked like a tiny Mars with pockmarks on it. It was just stunning view. So great telescope. Here's some of the images it's taken. Here is uh, one of the uh, Deer Lake group of galaxies, a beautiful picture. And here's one of M3. And just for comparison, I threw in one of my images of the Deer Lake galaxy that I took with my 12 and a half inch plane wave telescope from my backyard observatory. Not quite up to scratch, but not bad either. Now, the other major, major research effort that's going on, and this is jointly between Lowell Observatory and the US Naval Observatory, which of course is also has a station out in Flagstaff with a sizable telescope. But this is one of the optical interferometers, uh, Navy Precision Optical Interferometers. And uh, for those of you who may not know, but an interferometer is basically putting telescopes at very far distances from the center. And this way, what you get is the equivalent of a 400 meter diameter telescope. And then the light that it collects is brought through these arms under vacuum and very tricky uh, interactions 
to form an image or a spectrum or a diffraction pattern in the center. And it's possible through this, uh, this methodology to actually uh, develop images of some of the closest stars to us and actually see detail on their surface, like sunspots and flares and so on. This is a superb instrument. It's only limited in terms of light gathering power uh, because it can only look at the brightest nearby stars. But recently, large uh, one meter mirrors have been added. So this will essentially double its potential to look at fainter stars. It's directed by Lowell astronomer uh, Gerald Van Bell, who is also a friend of mine and uh, happens to be Canadian. So lots of stuff going on. Now in the uh, outreach program, uh, the uh, Lowell is booming as well. Um, the year before the COVID uh, uh, pandemic kicked in, uh, we had over 100,000 visitors that year. And uh, that's steadily increasing. And one of the reasons for this is this open Javali Open Deck Observatory. Javali is a local uh, uh, family of, uh, of uh, uh, very generous people. And what this is, is a public observing deck. This is a sliding building that can move over. And there are a bunch of telescopes here that can be used for observing everything from refractors to large reflectors, etc. There's a little bit of a museum and conference room back here. An absolutely wonderful facility. And in future, uh, probably next year, it's under construction now, is the Lowell Astronomy Discovery Center. Lowell has, determined, has always had to have public outreach. That was part of the will of Percival. It's in his, in his, uh, um, uh, in his uh, but he left behind one of his main wishes because he liked and enjoyed public education. And then recently, Lowell uh, Observatory, um, some of you probably know Ian McLennan, a Canadian, who uh, was very much involved uh, as a consultant here. Uh, he uh, was instrumental, I'm sure that you know, in terms of redeveloping the Vancouver uh, Planetarium and other uh, major planetaria and, and facilities in Canada. And he was hired along with a partner to come out and look at the Lowell uh, business plan essentially and, and suggest what Lowell should do in order to continue improving public outreach, which is basically a money maker for it, but also to continue with public education. And this will be the crowning achievement. Uh, what it'll have here on top is an open deck uh, with heated seats, no less, uh, planetarium. Inside, there will be a theater, a uh, museum, a uh, library, uh, and uh, many other facilities, uh, restaurant and, and uh, uh, gift shops uh, to bring in visitors uh, as we keep having each and every year, except for this year, of course. Uh, and uh, now Lowell only has limited access uh, with groups of 10 people or less, usually family members who can come in to view the telescope, etc on a reservation, on a pre-reserved basis. Uh, hopefully when COVID passes us, that'll be the end of that too. And uh, that's it for my talk. If any of you are interested in perhaps reading up on some of the topics I've discussed here, there are a number, I'll leave the slide on a little bit longer. Uh, there are a number of articles of mine, been sky and telescope, astronomy, uh, and uh, so forth, discussing and elaborating on some of the topics I've talked about tonight. And I hope you enjoy this little cartoon here because it's so very true. If your kids get interested in astrophotography, they will never have enough money for alcohol or drugs. Wiser words were never <laughs> spoken, in my opinion. Anyways, I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are some. Uh, so uh, fire away. We have a couple of questions coming in here, Klaus. Um, yes, I can hear you. Okay, good stuff. So uh, Howard asks, uh, can you please tell us a little bit about outreach? Uh, or sorry, can you please tell us a little bit about research being done at Happy Jack? Oh, absolutely. 
That's a good question. It would take a whole lecture in itself, actually. There's so much going on. But uh, two, two or three things that come to mind immediately is uh, uh, the, one of the reasons the telescope is built as it is, is because it can slew very rapidly in any direction of the sky. So if there is a newly discovered, uh, say, supernova, or if there's a newly discovered uh, um, flash somewhere in the, in the universe, as we now know, seems to be happening quite a bit, or if there's a newly discovered uh, asteroid, say, coming at us from the solar side, it can very quickly slew to that position and uh, immediately get uh, orbital and uh, positional data. In addition, what it does is uh, there's a major effort to use the telescope for exoplanetary hunting uh, in uh, collaboration with several astronomers and a very high resolution spectrograph now that's been developed they'll be able to, with luck, detect Earth-sized planets around nearby stars uh, more efficiently than has been the case so far. Uh, then there is a series of programs uh, that uh, uh, involve everything from studying um, uh, dwarf galaxies, which we're uh, now astronomers are realizing dwarf galaxies are far more interesting than just their size would suggest. Uh, many of them behave quite differently from large spirals and other galaxies. Uh, many of them seem to be centers of dark matter. Uh, and some of them have uh, a, a bursts of uh, a star formation, others do not. So that's a whole new area of research. And there are several astronomers here at Lowell that are, are um, experts in that. In addition, there are a number of astronomers at Lowell who are experts in comets, as you might expect. And again, getting high resolution spectra in images of comets, it'll be possible then to determine what composition they're of, made of and also determine their spin rates and other things of that nature. And uh, one other uh, um, program that I, comes to mind immediately is uh, we have several astronomers on staff who are expert in giant stars, mega, mega stars that uh, are unusual and, and also neutron stars and things of that sort. So essentially, Lowell Observatory with, the, with that uh, magnificent new telescope is going to be able to broaden its horizons in, in extensively and what's so good about it is that since it belongs to the observatory and has partners at a half a dozen other universities, all these other institutions have timeshare partnership with the observatory so that they will be guaranteed a certain time frame each year or each month or whatever the contract says, where their own astronomers have access to the telescope. Whereas if any astronomer, no matter how famous they might be, wants access to say the Keck telescope or the Gemini, you have to first submit a, a, a proposal. And then if you're lucky, you might get fund, funding for it and you might get access to it three years down the line sort of thing. Whereas if you're a member of the Lowell Consortium, that time frame is reduced a lot. Great. We, we have a couple more. We have lots of thank yous coming in. Somebody particularly liked the comparison of the, uh, the modern and the vintage uh, sketch of, of uh, Mars, which I also enjoyed uh, good, the conversation good. about the uh, uh, Mariner Valley. That was, that was very fascinating. Uh, Alan Dyer uh, has a question. Uh, he says, I understand Percival Lowell often use the Clark uh, with the aperture stopped down. What aperture, what aperture did he really use uh, you know, and have you, Klaus, compared the full aperture view versus the Clark stop down? Thanks. Well, thank you. And say hi to Alan for me. Good friend. Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, uh, the Clark has a, actually an iris diaphragm at the front end. And uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, Lowell realized at the time is one, well, two things. Number one, for an a, a achromatic refractor of that era, it was a rather fast focal ratio. It's only f16 as opposed to f18 or f20, like many of the classics were. They were built that way in order to reduce the effects of chromatic aberration. 
So what Clark would do often is close down uh, the aperture from 24 inches to depending on seeing and other conditions to, uh, you know, down to 18, 20, 20, 18, and even smaller. But he also had a tendency to do something which turned out to be quite wrong. He would often, especially if he was looking at things like Venus or glaring a planet like Mars, he would close the aperture down to as little as six inches in an effort to cut down glare and also to improve contrast and other things like that. And uh, a good friend of mine, local friend too, and somebody some of you may have heard of uh, before is William Sheehan, who is a, a, a very well-known uh, astronomy historian, but also a retired psychiatrist. He posited that by doing that, if you close uh, the uh, refractor down too much, and you have this brilliant image still in, in a smaller aperture, what you might, what Lowell probably did was have an ophthalmoscope effect, uh, which is what, you know, what opticians, uh, what, what uh, doctors use when they look at your eyes. And with that, he may well have, because often he saw similar patterns of canals on Venus, on Mercury, on Mars, and other places, even Saturn, that he was actually seeing a reflection of the blood vessels in his retina. And that may have contributed to many of the, uh, you know, the so-called canals that he thought he saw that were so like spider web thin. Uh, and that was uh, very likely uh, one of the big mistakes that he made. Uh, had he just closed the scope down a couple of inches to cut down on, I, and I've done that, uh, it's uh, sometimes the, uh, especially with, with the bright planet, for example, or the moon, uh, you really see the chromatic, the purple fringe, and by closing it down to 18 inches, which was kind of my favorite, uh, that disappears largely. Uh, and uh, then that, that's how I got my photographs, for instance, by cutting down on, on that excess coloration. Good question. Yeah, that was a really, really interesting reply. Uh, David Maynard uh, has a question. Uh, his question is, is the refractor, and I'm thinking he's referring to the 24 inch Clark, um, used for anything other than outreach? Like, is it, is it used at all for any research anymore or just for outreach? No, it's strictly uh, uh, used for, for outreach. Um, and uh, simply because, um, you know, there are, well, I, I should also mention, which I didn't do, um, the, the, uh, even though Flagstaff has a really very good uh, light pollution control, you know, as the world's first international dark sky city and has lots of good abatement, it's grown a lot. And so there's quite a halo of bright light. And so that basically has made Mars Hill as such not a great place for, for observing. Uh, and uh, several dec a couple of decades ago, in fact, when, when the, the light on pollution started increasing in Flagstaff before the, uh, the mitigation was put in place, uh, Lowell actually moved the bulk of its uh, research instruments uh, about 30 miles, uh, you know, quite 10, 15 miles south of there on Anderson Mesa. Uh, and that's where also the, the uh, interferometer is to get away from the lights of Flagstaff. So the big guns were there uh, and uh, that's where most of the research uh, was done. Now, many of those telescopes are become rather obsolete except for a couple. Uh, and, and that's in part why the uh, uh, Lowell Discovery Telescope was built and, and commissioned. So much, most of the real advanced cutting research now is done there uh, and with the interferometer. Great. Yeah, and we're what's, we're getting... what's interesting about the Clark is that it has a 12 inch Clark refractor finder telescope, which uh, many of us would kill for to have <laughs> just as an aside. <laughs> yeah, that, that finder would be, that would be a telescope in itself. Um, yep, yeah, lots indeed. of thanks coming in from, from Judy and uh, all kinds of other folks, Colleen, uh, Stanley, uh, David. Uh, so people are wondering what I'm doing. Um, in, in presentation mode, Klaus can't really see the questions. So, uh, and I'm also acting as sort of a, a, a face 
uh, for him to focus on too while, while we're taking a look at this. Um, and you'll see these, these thank yous. People are really appreciative. I, I, I certainly love the presentation. Well, I'm so um, glad. Yeah. And, and I did have a question because, because you're, you're a, a pretty good observer as well. And uh, I was really excited because I was going to ask you about observing on Happy Jack. And then you actually referred to uh, an observation you, you made there using about 600 power. Um, and I think you said the moon was Io of, of Jupiter kind of looking like one of the moons or kind of looking like Mars. Yes. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about actually observing um, through that instrument and, and maybe any other special sort of visual observations you made uh, through the Clark. Right. Well, the Clark, to begin, start with it, uh, I've had op opportunities to, to, in addition to, to the moon, to actually observe um, uh, both uh, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, uh, Fairmount, and Mars, of course, when it's around. But I also had a peek at, uh, under conditions several years ago, and a good seeing at uh, Uranus. And it was quite interesting because it really uh, is a sort of, you know, a sort of greenish blue coloration. Mm -hmm. What I was able to see actually is the tilt of the axis because the polar region that's kind of facing us is actually lighter green or whatever color you want to call it than the rest of it. And I'd never seen huh. that before. And that was pretty exciting. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, and the the other thing that's wonderful to look at through it because there's no color involved is globular clusters. I mean, they're just stunning. Yeah, uh, you know, you have 24 inch of aperture, and uh, all of the eyepieces that we now have are top notch modern eyepieces, of course, mostly teleview. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so some uh, when the transparency and seeing are good. Uh, uh, a look at uh, any one of the globulars is just blows you away. Huh. Uh, with the with the DCT, um, you know, not the DCT, it's not called. It used to be called Discovery Channel Telescope because the Discovery people funded a large portion of it, but now it's called the Lowell Discovery Telescope. Um, uh, it's so the LDT. It's a bit confusing, but that's how it is. Uh, yeah, the the uh, the. Uh, the Several locations I've had a chance to look for through it. You can't do that anymore now because it's just totally commissioned for research. So they don't do that anymore. Uh, but uh, it be, as it was being prepared, uh, one of the astronomers there invited, he gave us a talk to our local astronomy club, the Coconina Astronomical Society. And we were so excited about what the, what the um, telescope would be able to do. And so he invited us out for a viewing session. And wow. it was interesting because as we were driving out there on a Saturday, it looked like it was going to rain. It was cloudy. And a lot of people said, oh, I'm not going to drive all that distance and didn't go. And those of us who went were disappointed at first because it was overcast. And then he showed us the facilities where they recoat the mirror when they move it out. You know, every two years, they have to put a new... Uh, uh, aluminum coating on it and they have a special shop for that and he showed us how this was done and so on and so forth and then as the sun was setting uh, he went outside and he looked up and he said oh my god it's perfectly clear so we rushed inside and he had a series of objects he wanted to show us uh, Jupiter of course and uh, one of the most other most beautiful objects I've, I've ever seen is uh, is the planetary nebula that's known as the Eskimo Nebula. I don't know if any of you have seen that because it looks a little bit like the face of an Eskimo in a parka thing. And it was gorgeous. You could see colors. You could see the, uh, the lacing. It looked like there was fine lace around the, the, the periphery of it. Absolutely glorious. Uh, we looked at uh, M82. And uh, because the field of view is quite narrow, the only thing we could see was the central portion that is a starburst, uh, you know, uh, region of the galaxy. That was absolutely stunning. I mean, you, it's like looking at, at, you know, at some of the best Hubble pictures, <laughs> only wow. they're real wow. right there. Uh, so, yeah, that was quite a treat for all of us. And, uh, but Jupiter, to my mind, and, and Io was, was the best. 
And in fact, we had to pry people away because there was like 30 or so of us standing in line <laughs> to get their look. Okay, move, move, my turn, you know. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Wow, cool. Thank thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. That's amazing. We got a we got a quick question from uh, David Cold, and then I think uh, Clark wants to say something. So is that okay, Clark? Yep. Perfect. Okay, good. So um, David Kolb, who who I had to Google because I was like, that person's name is familiar. He does some amazing planetary images and is also uh, an aficionado of, of uh, older star charts like I am. So I actually recognize his name. Uh, did they keep the Pi tin cover on the 12 inch finder scope when they restored the 24 inch refractor? As a matter of fact, they did. <laughs> And I'll tell you why. That's an excellent question. Because the entire instrument and the dome are on the, uh, on the National Historic Register, you cannot really modify anything. You can clean it up. You can grease it. You can, if it's broken, you can machine a new piece, but it has to be of the same type, wood or brass or whatever, because it's historic instrument. And so, yes, that, that, Dew cap was or dust cap was was still there. Wow. Um, wow. What's the on, the only uh, quotes cheating that was done with the Clark uh, because it, it, you know it has it has uh, setting circles like they all did in those days. And in order to find an object beforehand, you really had to climb up the ladder behind there, take a reading and have another person move the telescope until you got to the right coordinates to find the given object. Well, that's kind of hard to do when you have 20 people in the dome wanting to look at something. So uh, the, the restorers cheated and, uh, and put little electronic uh, digitized uh, devices that will actually read out, you know, RA and DEC and then you read out where the instrument is and off you go and just watch the little numbers change and bingo, you have your object. Wow. So it's not go to, it's still manual. <laughs> it's cool. sort of yeah. cheating, but not really. Uh, and uh, that's about the only difference uh, in terms of what was that. Everything else is authentic, cleaned up or uh, many bolts and nuts and handles were you know, beyond repair. So they had to be manufactured to match what was what was the original, and it's it's just a wonderful restoration. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, David, and thank you for answering the question, Klaus. I'll turn it over to Clark here now. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> I was curious about. Uh, I would argue that uh, Percival Lowell's observing chair is the most famous chair in all of astronomy. <laughs> and, um, uh, is the original still there or, or are we using a replica for that? Well, there are several theories on that. The mythology, I presume is mythology, has that it's the original chair. Uh, I have my doubts, but it does look, whatever they put up there looks very much like the original. However, the ladder, uh, you know, that large uh, vertical device, that uh, had a platform to, uh, to raise and lower the chair. Um, that's uh, um, still authentic. Um, and uh, what's also authentic is a whole bunch of, of uh, eyepieces and uh, uh, other devices that were used. Uh, and they're all kept in the museum at Lowell uh, to uh, you know, original parts that are no longer being used. And one thing too that was done, which I forgot to mention, during the International Planetary Patrol, because most of the telescopes that were made for that patrol were in fact uh, um, uh, Cassegrains, they of course had no chromatic aberration. So in order to correct the uh, chromatic aberration on the Clark and on the 27 inch uh, refractor in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, they built little devices that you built inside the tube that were color correcting. And so consequently, uh, the photographs that were taken through those two telescopes were actually fairly color free. It's almost like having an apochromatic refractor today. And, uh, but then when the program ended, everybody ignored those and took them out. So unfortunately, I wish they'd left them in, but again, that wouldn't be historically correct, I suppose. 
now nobody knows what happens to them. So, yeah, keep keeping track of historical things. Uh, the, the 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 library at Lowell and archival collection has, uh, which is wonderful, and many volunteers come out there and actually sift through the original photographs and plates and and documents and notes and letters. Uh, there's a uh, just a uh, you know a gold mine of information about uh, who wrote to what and what so people did at the time and and uh, uh, some of the notes observing notes and so on. It's really wonderful to to have all of that in one place because in part Lowell Observatory at being a, a, a National Historic Register is also a museum by definition. And so, uh, uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's just lots to see here. And I hope many of you can come down once this is over and come for a visit. And I would suggest that uh, if you do come and haven't been down to Arizona or seen the Grand Canyon or, or uh, Sunset Crater and other nearby beautiful things, just come to Flagstaff, make that your center point, rent a car and drive all over the place. You, can, you will never get tired. So much to see, the USGS, the Naval Observatory, Lowell, uh, the Museum of uh, Northern Arizona, splendid museum, uh, and then many national parks and monuments. Yeah, then the <clears throat> crater is worth a look too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, when you, I was fascinated with the uh, the origin of stacking that you discussed, uh, but when I saw the the image of Jupiter, and I should say this now, um, if you if the attendees want to go to uh, the RASC website and you can search for Klaus Brash, you will find a lot of your Jupiter sketches that you did <laughs> in the early 1960s, maybe in the 59 as well in Montreal, I believe. And yep. the Jupiter uh, image that you showed that Slifer took reminded me a lot of, of your own sketches that were done a few years later. Uh, well, thank you. That's very kind. Um, I, Randall, do you have anything? Oh, just unmuted myself. Um, thanks, Klaus, for doing that and covering all that ground. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I do, I do have a couple of questions. You partially answered this, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, so have you had a chance to use any of the original eyepieces or are they firmly locked away in the museum? Actually, uh, I have. Uh, now they're all basically locked away and have been replaced with, you know, much better um, uh, modern eyepieces. But uh, yeah, mo most of the original eyepieces were um, very small. They were, uh, in fact, they weren't even an inch and a quarter. I think they were even smaller, some of them. And they were more like microscope eyepieces. Um, but again, there was, nothing, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was nothing standard then. However, uh, some of them were, you know, Huygens design or Ramsden design, because that's what, you know, was available in those days. And in some ways, they were fine to use with that telescope because uh, of the long focal length. And uh, they would, the eyepieces would not have in introduced much in the way of uh, chromatic aberration. Uh, because you had such a long, you know, focal length so that the, the incoming light beam would be narrow enough to fit in the field lens of the eyepiece. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, I, beyond trying it once just for fun with, with uh, one of the eyepieces that was lying around, and we didn't even know what the focal length was because what they would have ingrained <laughs> on them is the actual magnification, meaning that they were probably made for microscopes. So, I, I don't know more about that um, in, in detail, unfortunately, but yeah. I do recall uh, years ago, I had the privilege of actually looking through the 60 inch uh, reflector at Mount Wilson and they had their, they were using their original eyepieces. And uh, because that telescope has such an enormous focal length, the idea there was not so much to get high magnification, you wanted to reduce the magnification by using very low, yeah, very um, uh, large and, and uh, uh, long focal length eyepieces so that you could actually take advantage of that. And I remember one eyepiece that was, I believe, a Heiken style was about the size of a, of a, of a, a beer mug. 
with the big lens, probably a two and a half or three inch eye lens, and you almost felt like you could use both eyes to look through it. <laughs> so, yeah. Very impressive. So impressive in itself, right? The size of a small Mac Cass. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Clark has, Clark has an experience. Clark visited um, uh, Melbourne and the uh, Great Melbourne Telescope. So one of oh, the yeah. last great, great research ones with, the, I think it was 48 inch speculum mirror. And, yes. and Clark showed me the picture of the, oh, I'm sure you've seen this Klaus. This giant, huge eyepiece. I mean, just, it looks like about the size of an eight inch, I mean, I probably exaggerate. It looks like the size of an eight inch Celestron, Mike uh, <laughs> Schmidt. Yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's at least seven inch diameter eyepiece. That's right. The whole right. case, the case was a trunk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you have a chance to look through it, Clark? Oh, well, um, it was refurbished. Uh, yeah. Remember the, the glass mirror was was uh, destroyed in the wildfire. Yes. And they right. brought the whole thing back, and the, the speculum yeah. mirror was 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 just on a on a on a rack. Yeah. You know, right. 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 Currently rebuilding it. Oh, that's yeah. I heard about that. That's great. That's I have one last question. Yes. If, you don't want to answer, if you don't want to answer it, you don't have to. Okay. Um, so for revenue and just for public outreach, of course, the public outreach and the public programs are really important for law, I'm, I'm guessing, yep. and because it's a private foundation. So they can use, they can leverage their history. I mean, it's about leveraging the history and tying that in, I guess, to the future and, and modern astrophysical research. So my question is, how do they handle the figure of Percival Lowell? I mean, he was, he was controversial during his lifetime and afterwards. I mean, all types of things were thrown at him. Uh, I think people of Sagan's and Kuiper's um, generation would have blamed him for what looked like the uh, widespread uh, death of planetary astronomy in the first half of the 20th century. So well, it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I know where you're going with this. And, and uh, obviously, um, you know, they, they'd like to play up uh, the positive things that he did. And he did a lot of positive things. I mean, he was an innovator uh, in, in terms of, for example, you know, looking for Pluto or in terms of uh, spectroscopy. Um, and uh, he was uh, he was wrong on many uh, th things that he proposed, and I'm not just talking about the canals. Um, but he was also one of the believers, and this persisted all the way, really, till the 1960s, uh, that Venus, under its cloudy and and thick atmosphere, was in fact a steaming jungle. Um, and a lot of people believed that at the time because there was no alternative to, you know, defy it. Um, what interests me is that he was not in the least bit interested in uh, the moon. <laughs> you know, you never hear very much about that. And it, they would have been in an excellent position photographically at the time to take some stunning lunar photos. I never thought about that. That's remarkable. That's absolutely yeah, remarkable. And, 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 you know, I, I've seen no evidence of that. Um, but also what he did do, which, which uh, number one, he had the foresight uh, to realize that observatories to be, astronomical observatories to be uh, useful really had to be uh, high elevation, preferably, uh, and also in, in uh, dry uh, uh, climates. Um, and uh, he was certainly correct about that. Uh, and the other thing that, that I think he, he deserves a lot of credit for, even though when he did his public outreach, much of what he spun was mythology because of the, you know, his ideas about planetary evolution and Martians. He considered it his duty as an educated person uh, and a scientist of sort to let the public know why this was important and what, what he did. Uh, and, and why astronomy was so important. I mean, he did love astronomy uh, and uh, he did hire some outstanding people. So that's kind of where the focus goes. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea of the canals is downplayed. I mean, people, you can't hide it, but people will say, well, he was wrong. And he was probably um, seeing things that weren't there, but he wasn't the only one. 
I mean, uh, if you ever look through uh, some of the, um, uh, uh, who was the French uh, popular oh, Flammarion. writer? Flammarion. Flammarion. Uh, you know, if you look through uh, back issues of, and I think they're, they were only printed about for eight years, um, L'Astronomie Populaire, it's filled with drawings and sketches of Mars and by reputable observers at the time, arguing whether Canal A or Canal B had doubled. I mean, it was that specific. Everybody believed that was for real. And in part, I attribute that to, you know, the, the, um, the canal mania at the time. Uh, people were willing to believe that. And the idea was that you couldn't always see them clearly on Mars or, because seeing conditions would prevent you from doing that. And only in moments of brilliant transparency and steady seeing would you actually see them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was certainly crazy. What, what's ironic to me uh, as well is... Um, What's happening now is all of the original um, Planet X searches taken with you know smaller telescopes earlier on before before Clyde Tombaugh and the 13 inch, uh, they're all being digitized and they're a gold mine of information as you can imagine. They're they're finding you know uh, novas and supernovas. They're finding asteroids that uh, that hadn't been necessarily uh, recorded before or after. And, and so all sorts of interesting information that's gonna be available there as well for again, mostly scholars and historians, but also others. So. Great, so time domain, uh, a resource for time domain astronomy, yeah. Yeah, right, right. Anyways, uh, for those of you who are, who would like to know more about Klaus's career and his time in the RASC, at least the earlier <laughs> bit, um, He's got a very nice article, which I think is in the next JRASC. Actually, I do have one more question. Yes. When, you were, when, Clark, uh, when Klaus was a kid, his father, and, and I think you helped your father, you put together a nice three inch refractor. Yes. More surplus parts. It looks yes. really good in the photographs. Do you still have it? I wish. Uh, the problem is I, I, that telescope, which was my first decent one, uh, it was actually uh, built in Toronto because before we moved to Montreal, I joined the, the RASC in, in Toronto. And there was a man there who had war surplus optics. Uh, he was a member of, of the Toronto Centre. I don't remember his name. And he had a whole collection of lenses. And I paid all of $13 for that lens, which was, that was a lot of money back then. <laughs> yes, it was. But he also had five inch uh, refracting lenses. And of course, they were out of reach, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we, we built that. And then a few years later uh, in Montreal, I got aperture fever and uh, <laughs> I ordered a, an eight inch. Uh, mirror uh, from Cave Optical. And that mirror was actually handcrafted by Alika Herring. Oh, the great lunar. Uh, great yeah, mirror great maker lunar. and a great yeah. observer who actually worked on the lunar mapping program later on. And he's the guy who did the site testing for Mauna Kea. Yes, he did. Good heavens, uh, that's really and, cool. Oh, it Have is. you got the mirror? Have you got the mirror? <laughs> I wish I did. See oh. what happened, my family was, not dirt poor, but pretty poor. And then when I when I uh, went to college, uh, um, you know, we didn't have enough money. So I decided, well, I'm not going to have time for a hobby now anyways. So uh, I sold them all. And uh, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> but, you know, it was necessity rather than what I wanted. Yeah. So they might still be out there somewhere. They might be. <laughs> yeah. Whoever bought them got great deals, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are some of the regrets we have in time. So I will turn myself off because I'm getting in. I'm, I have interference here. So, but thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for your encouragement. Yeah, thank you uh, for all of this. Um, 
I, we could go on for hours, I think. But so we yeah, can. yeah, but my cat would object. I can hear her screaming. <laughs> I, I <clears throat> want to send out a note. We have a few members of the history committee here and with Phil here as well. Um, we decided we would do this on a monthly basis. And if we do that next month, we're getting pretty close to something called Christmas. So yes. we want to push it a week earlier into January, but we also be looking for other um, other topics and whatnot. And I'll email the committee and again, Phil, because uh, you'll need to be on this too. Um, I want to thank, first of all, the attendees for joining us and I, it's on YouTube live and so others will get a chance to view it. Uh, Phil for running the show. Uh, Jenna Hines, who's not here, she was organizing, uh, helped us organize this. And of course, uh, uh, Chris Beckett and Randall Rosenfeld for uh, helping uh, manage the questions and things like that. So with that, and finally, I will thank once again, Klaus for an outstanding talk. And I'm, I'm delighted that you agreed to do this last month. Um, it's been a wonderful evening. Thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. All right. So I, I guess nothing further to do except to hand it over to Phil. Without further ado, I'll just give my own personal thanks to the History Committee for the hard work of, of scheduling these things and, and, and finding amazing speakers like Klaus. And Klaus, thank you so much for a very entertaining and informative presentation. You've definitely put Flagstaff on my travel itinerary for the, uh, <laughs> when, when, when travel happens again. <laughs> yes, and, uh, yes, exactly. So, so thank you so much. I really, uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, and I, it was a pleasure. I, I owe so much to the to the RASC that that this is just a small way of paying back. Oh. So thank you, and uh, everybody stay safe. And uh, maybe we can do this again. I have more topics that might interest you down the line. Be careful what you wish for. We, we will call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank all right. you all. Thanks everyone for attending and coming out on a Monday night. And we really appreciate uh, everyone being here. Good night. I, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Good night, everyone.